Hello, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and I am so pleased to be joined by Kim Taylor Thompson, professor of clinical law emerita of NYU School of Law, where she focused on the impact of race and gender in public policy. She is the editor of Progressive Prosecution, Race and Reform in Criminal Justice, founder of the Criminal Justice Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, and chair of the Equal Justice Initiative, founded by, as we all know, Brian Stevenson. And welcome so much. Kim, Thank you. What a resume. I kept saying, what, what, that, and oh. and more incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, and, and you are a New York City girl. I am. I'm born and bred, Harlem, USA. Right, and and went off to Brown and Yale. And tell us a little bit about we we want to know how you wind up being this legal powerhouse oh. at NYU and <laughs> Brennan, uh, you know, from from Harlem, USA. Well, I think um, I'm I'm not sure I would um, agree with the legal powerhouse. I might quibble with that a bit, but I think as a child I was the one in the family who was always arguing, so my parents expected me to be a lawyer. But I grew up in Harlem in the Riverton projects, and um, you know, grew up growing up there was amazing. Um, up until I was ten, I was in Harlem, and then we moved to the Bronx after that. And it was an amazing, nurturing environment where I got to see black folks doing lots of amazing David things. David Jenkins, David the mayor, was, right? I, 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 David, I saw David become mayor, right. but I knew David well before he became mayor. In the Riverton projects, you had uh, people like um, um, Clifford Alexander, you had, um, you had judges, you had all sorts of amazing role models for you that gave you a sense that you could accomplish anything. And so I got the chance to actually spread my wings and went to Brown, went to Yale, and then ultimately um, became a lawyer. And, and uh, it's been the scenic route, but it's been great. Right, right. Well, you and I were talking briefly before we started about your husband, that you two wrote the book together and taught together yeah. and have just uh, retired, retired or, or, or evolved, right, we're, as Serena would say. Yes, we're evolving into <laughs> retirement. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but we're trying to get there. But yeah, yeah, the two of us, um, our, our backgrounds are so similar. Um, I, I was a public defender for 10 years. He was in California. Um, we both taught, um, and we taught together. And, you know, some people say, oh, my God, you've been married almost 30 years, and how do you continue to teach and do all these things together? And we found it worked for us. You know, we sort of build off of each other. We, we understand um, how to be in the same room together and to bring out different kinds of points. So it's great fun. It's great fun. And, and I understand you were introduced by the great Charles Ogletree. Yes, yes. Um, Charles um, uh, tried to introduce us about seven years before we actually met. I was in, in D.C. working as a public defender with Charles. And Tony had gotten to know, um, know him at Harvard Law School. And um, so he was trying to get us together, and I, he basically said all the wrong things to make me uh, give this man a call. He said, you know, you share the same politics, you know, I think that you sort of see the world the same. And at that time, Tony was living in California, and I was in D.C., and to me, it just made no sense to call someone who was 3,000 miles away just because we shared the same politics, so I never called. And it wasn't until I went out to California to teach at Stanford um, that I actually just happened to meet him. Um, Stanford was hosting a panel, and he was on the panel, and I went, and, and that day I hadn't, I had rushed, I had put on a baseball cap, gone to the, to the panel, and when I got there, I said, oh my God, I wish I had done my hair, and so I finally got to meet him, and oh. a year later we were married. So. Wow, wow. So Charles uh, Ogletree, for those of you who don't know, also taught Barack and Michelle, and uh, and we have another uh, a common friend. It's uh, Derek Bell, yes. the great Derek Bell yes. uh, professor, who you say brought me into teaching. And and Derek is um, somebody that um, touched so many so many souls and changed so many lives. And he definitely changed mine. Um, he helped me think about law teaching. I ultimately became his colleague at NYU. And um, he's he was just. A brilliant lawyer and thinker and 
understood lots of issues about race and and um, how our communities have been marginalized and he just got you thinking in ways that always made you say wow you know why didn't I think of that before I talked with Derek he was just that kind of inspiration I miss him terribly I know so what do you think about this Fuhrer over critical race theory by oh, the way it's outrageous. Derek Bell was the originator of it, yeah. uh, a, a highly uncontroversial, just a very brilliant analysis. Um, your, your thoughts on what has happened to his uh, theories? I, I, I think it's, um, it's outrageous to see how this has become the political football that it's become. And, and it's morphed into something that it, it actually isn't. Uh, the story about what critical race theory is um, has become something that has, um, people think that it's, it's damaging, it's destructive, it's, it's talking about race in ways that it's not. It's actually simply saying, if you're gonna look at our history, if you're gonna look at what's happened in this country, you need to have race perspectives that are in play. You need to understand how race is intertwined with American history. You need to understand and look at that history critically so that you understand what actually happened to various communities, how this, this country is actually built on genocide and then built on the backs of enslaved people. That's what critical race theory is trying to get you to understand. The, the full story of what this, this country has, has been about in terms of its history. And, and at Brennan, at NYU, at the yearly uh, Bell Lecture, yeah, yeah. Uh, and our love to Janet Dewart Bell, his, uh, his widow, the, who we both uh, know and, uh, and, and adore love. As, yeah. as, as well. Yeah. So I, I, we need, if when I was reading the introduction yeah. uh, to your, your very powerful book and, and, and so much needed so that we can understand uh, what we're talking about when yeah. we're talking about criminal prosecution and how yeah. it is unbalanced and unfair. You describe the killing of George Floyd and, and really for the first time I, I felt this, you say it was very casual, uh, vulgar, uh, but you know, a thoughtless kind of, yes, I'm killing this man and exactly. it's okay. Uh, talk to us. Yeah, if you go back, and it's hard to, to watch that video because when we watched it, you know, all of us saw ourselves in the, the face of George Floyd and, and, and we felt his pleas when he was calling out to his mother, we, we felt that because we recognized that you know, there but for the grace of God go I. You know, it takes less than 10 minutes for somebody who looks like you and me to become a statistic. But what we saw in those moments with Derek Chauvin putting his knee on his neck was that it was casual for Chauvin. You know, he had his hand in his pocket the entire time. This was not something that was new or something that would cause him to pause, it was routine, it was casual, it was reflexive. And that level of violence is not something that is, you know, limited to George Floyd. It's, it's that level of violence that marginalized communities have dealt with. And we, we've been screaming about for, for decades, for so many years, and no one has ever paid attention to it. And so we had the video capturing in that moment what we see on a regular basis, this degradation, this humiliation, this violence towards us just because of our skin color, just because there is a belief that it's okay to do that to us. And that's what got my husband, Tony, and I saying, you know, we need to sit down and really think about what prosecution looks like here and begin to make sure that the people who are making such tremendous decisions about our lives, the lives of people who look like you and me, black and brown people, that they understand how race is shaping and misshaping the experience of justice in this country. And we need to make sure that we actually slow things down and help them develop a racially conscious, racially alert lens that they can use as they think about um, making decisions in the criminal legal system. There was a study at Yale that actually demonstrated the bias of teachers in the classroom. Yeah, so it's interesting. One of the things that um, I write about in the book is um, the fact that we as a country have this 
view of black and brown children that they are not valuable. Um, the, the kind of care and nurturing that we almost reflexively give to white children, we don't give to black and brown children. We see black and brown children as expendable. And um, we see it every day in the criminal justice system, which is what I talk about in the book. But the study that you're talking about is a study that took place at Yale, which was looking at teachers and looking at how teachers um, respond when you um, ask them, um, who's the troublemaker in, in the classroom? Or who's the one who's going to be causing problems? Their eyes immediately go to the black or brown child. It, it, the, the, the data was, was so disturbing, so stunning, but so confirming of what it is that we already knew was happening, that we, from very early ages, start to see our children as something uh, that is um, bad, predatory, criminal. Um, we don't see them as somebody that um, might be acting out because they're children. Um, we don't see that um, children might be misbehaving because they've experienced some trauma in their lives. We just immediate, immediately stigmatize them and say they're bad, they're criminal, and that's what begins the school to prison pipeline or what I like to think of as the trauma to prison pipeline. That trauma to prison yeah. tra uh, yeah. pipeline, right, right. Um, and, uh, you know, we've seen so many of these uh, stories where black and brown children are thrown to the floor by police officers and security guards. And in if what you write about is that then the sentencing yeah. of what these children get for it, it, it's, it's amazing. Um, we really do have two systems of justice in, in this country. And when you see how we take kids and put them into an adult criminal justice system that was never designed for them, and what we do to them, it, 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 it ought to pull at your heartstrings, but it doesn't. And that's the other troubling part of this, is that we've almost come to expect that it's okay to treat black and brown children this way. You know, in every single state in this country, middle schoolers are treated as adults, or can be treated as adults in the criminal justice system. So that means that they, they face uh, adult prosecution and adult punishment. We've, we've charged children as young as eight, eight years old as adults in the criminal justice system. And what we see is, I think the reason that we see this happening is that we have allowed this lethal lie to sort of take hold and to have intergenerational effects. And, and, and that lie is that our children are not children, right? Um, it, it, it's an American thing that we look at black and brown children as less than human. It's an American thing, a handed down thing, that allows us to view our children as expendable. And our kids face what I like to call a, a triple threat, and it, it's horrific when you think about it. The first is that we dehumanize our children. Um, we see them as predators, sometimes super predators. We see them as animals. We describe them as in that way. And if you describe someone as vermin or less than human, it's much easier to step back and allow any kind of treatment of that, that insect, that vermin, right? It's no longer a child. It's no longer human. You don't have the moral constraints that you might have if you're looking at that person as a child. So we have dehumanization. We have these exaggerated perceptions of the dangerousness of, of kids of color. We see them as bigger than they are. We, we perceive them as being larger and more in need of formal control. And so we, we allow the kind of aggressive policing that we see all the time that Breonna Taylor and George Floyd are, are um, uh, examples of. We see that with our children as well, that police use these aggressive methods against them because, again, they see them as more dangerous than they actually are. And the final um, part of this triple threat is that we adultify our children. There are all sorts of studies, these amazing studies that came out of NYU by um, a professor there, Professor Goff, who did um, uh, yeah, these wonderfully robust studies looking at how we will look at black and brown kids and see them as four and five and six years older than they are. So you take a 12-year-old and we will see that person as a 16-year-old. So if you're seeing that 12-year-old as a 16-year-old, 
then again, you're not giving them the protections and the care and nurturing that you would any other 12-year-old. And you, you offer up some so solutions, yeah. prescriptions yeah. For, uh, for all of this. First of all, the raising of the criminalization age. Exactly. Eight-year-olds should not exactly. be exactly. tried as adults. That's exactly right. We need to raise the age that no one under 21 should be put into the adult criminal justice system. It's just not designed for kids. There are ways that you, we want, we ought to be thinking about diverting children out of the, the justice system, period because we know that what often gets people engaged in the kind of misbehavior that leads to um, criminal involvement is trauma-based. It's, um, uh, there are other needs that haven't been addressed. And so if we could begin to divert people out of the system, then that would be the first step. But yes, we want to raise the age for those who actually um, perhaps um, have not been able to benefit from those kinds of interventions. We also think that prosecutors need to get more proximate um, to the communities that they're, they're um, supposed to be serving, um, um, but ultimately know very little about. Uh, we see so many black and brown people coming into the criminal legal system and being charged, and prosecutors don't get out into those communities to get to know who those anything about those communities, anything about the options that are available to kids, the kinds of environments that they're growing up with. So proximity, I think, is something that would help people now start to see kids as human beings as opposed to, oh, this is the next case, or this is this case, or this is a um, robber, a burglar, you know, a personification of the charge. So getting proximate helps. And then finally, I think that people need to create environments in their, in their offices, prosecutors need to create environments in their offices where they actually talk about these issues mm -hmm. and th talk about the developmental issues that kids have. That we go through periods where we actually mature into better behavior. Um, our, our brains are still developing uh, well into our mid-20s. And so if we have a developmental lens and recognize that this isn't a fully formed human being at 12 or at eight, that they, if we intervene in different ways, we can actually get them off of this path, that that might begin to make some changes. Right, well, you, you're arguing for uh, compassion. Yes. You know, a sense of yes. understanding. And in your chapter, you talk about a 16-year-old who was sentenced yeah. for, to life. Yeah. yeah. For, uh, yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah. Bobby Bostick um, was, um, is facing, he's serving a sentence of 241 years, okay? Just the numbers are, are mind-boggling. Well, beyond one's lifetime. It's well, more than, beyond, yes. Right, so. right. And it's for a crime that he committed at age 16. And what happened was he was with a, a, an older boy, so he was 16, the older boy was, was 18. And they were walking along the street and they saw something that was tempting to them. They saw a car full of Christmas gifts. And what they did was they made the impulsive decision to steal those, to, to rob the people who sure. were bringing those gifts. They held them up, Bobby and this other boy held them up at gunpoint. So that, this is wrong. I'm not trying to suggest that there's anything right in what they did, but just understanding why a kid might be drawn to do that is not something that entered into the conversation. What we saw was huge media reaction. Um, people for were outraged. For stealing. At Christmas time. People were outraged that right. kids were taking these gifts from other kids and they wanted the prosecutors to throw the book at these kids. That's and more than the book, 240 they, years. Absolutely. What happened was the prosecutors decided to charge um, them as adults. And um, uh, with Bobby, what they did was they said, all right, we'll give you a plea offer of 30 years. Um, if you uh, admit to doing this, we will agree to a limit of 30 years. Ugh. At 16, no 16-year-old is going to be able to say, sure, I'll, I'll just spend I'll take, the next... I'll do the 30. Right. And he was getting, you know, advice from friends and from, not from his lawyers, from, but from other people that he, whose views he valued, other kids, um, saying, you know, don't go for that, don't take that 30 years, go to trial. So he did. And he was convicted of multiple counts of armed robbery. And the judge 
I, I think in part responding to the media, in part responding to this notion that somebody had done something that um, you know, harmed a lot of other people. No, nobody was actually injured, um, nobody was killed, but she said, I'm throwing the book at you, I'm giving you 240 years. <laughs> Just outrageous, yeah. and, I, and I know that you you are also chair of Brian Stevens' yes. Equal Justice Initiative. The thing you're fighting there, too, is this. Children should not be in jail, and should, they Absolutely. should not be given 240 years Absolutely. for a robbery when we know full and well, you know, that others are committing much more horrendous crimes and getting away with exactly, it. Exactly, not facing anything near that, and it's really based on race that we're seeing the bulk of children who are being charged as adults, um, they're black and brown. But EJI is doing amazing things in Montgomery. And it started with Brian's vision. Um, and Brian actually went to South Africa um, and went to the Apartheid Museum in Johannesburg. And it is a, if you've ever been, it's a small, unassuming place. And you walk through that, um, that museum and when you come out on the other end, you are fundamentally changed. It's just so powerful. And I remember going through that museum and saying, wow, this is amazing. Brian goes through the museum, comes back and says, we need something like that here. For lynching. Exactly. So right. that we understand exactly what that through line was from slavery to Jim Crow to lynching, this, this through line of racial terror. Mm -hmm. That gets us all the way up to the criminal justice system, and we need to document it, and we need people to be able to walk through and experience it. So we created the lynching memorial, um, where you walk through and you see the names, the countless names of people who were lynched. I think I was uh, telling you, I'm from Alabama, and uh, visited it, uh, the, the lynching museum, with a distant cousin, and she was had pointed out to us, oh yes, you know, that's a cousin of ours, you know, symbolized in the, lynch, who was lynched, you know, probably again, uh, you know, for some, for nothing or. That's what it was always. It was, you know, you can read the plaques. Um, this individual, um, you know, spoke to a white woman. This person was disrespectful. This person uh, didn't lower his, his gaze when, when a white person looked at him. These were the reasons that we lynched people on the courthouse steps. We did it out in front of people. So he is documenting that. And, and creating a memorial that actually gives you a place to go and to touch that name and to say, uh, you know, I remember. Collecting the soil where people were actually lynched, again, it helps you recognize that this was real. This was, uh, there's mm -hmm. blood and, and tears and history in this soil and we're capturing it so that we won't forget it. We will remember. It's a powerful, powerful image. It you started that way, you know, this is, this is blood soaked dirt it that is. It is. many, many of the person died, uh, gave their lives for such ridiculous, ridiculous things. The interesting thing that, that's happening now is that again, rather, rather than just simply uh, documenting the, the deaths, you all are now working on preventing yeah. those deaths and yeah. also reaching out into health pro providing yeah. and, it's, it's you know. It's hugely exciting, you know, Brian, um, and the entire staff at EJI have really evolved from um, a, a place where they focused on death penalty um, advocacy, really trying to get people off of death row, and um, it's still a core part of what they do. But they started noticing things like um, children were being put, sentenced to die in prison. So what can we do about that? They noticed that we needed to create a dish, different racial narrative, one that was paying attention to that racial history and understanding that through line. And so they evolved to do that. And now what they're doing is they're saying, you know, when we look at all these systems that intersect and affect marginalized communities, affect black and brown communities, what we see is that we, we, we can't treat each system as though it's a separate system. Um, we need to take a look at what's happening in the education system. We need to think about what's happening in the health system. COVID really um, exposed a lot of the racial inequities uh, around healthcare. 
We need to think about how people get food. We need to think about food insecurity. So Brian is really beginning to think about that and how it is that he can partner with doctors, he can partner with other health care providers to create a model that will provide um, uh, health support, food care, uh, food stamp support in Alabama, which is a state that provides almost nothing. 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 Absolutely nothing. I know that people are going to want to buy copies of your book, uh, Progressive Prosecution. Who, some of the other, you've edited it there. Who are the other authors? And briefly, if you could just give us a... Yeah. A, a run through of what the other topics. We were so lucky with the people that we got. Um, we have um, uh, Dan Satterberg, who was um, a, a district attorney for 35 plus year in se years in Seattle. And Dan wasn't somebody who uh, ran on a progressive prosecution platform, but he evolved into it. He recognized that we cannot continue to build prisons and to build this, this carceral state. We actually need to start dismantling it and building the instead. I loved that, build the instead. You know, divert people out of the system, engage in criminal justice reform, and that's what his chapter talks about. How he came to that recognition, how he recognized through his own family that had been touched by drug addiction and public health issues, that we needed to have a public health approach to a lot of the behavioral problems that lead people into the criminal legal system. So Dan writes a chapter, we have a chapter written by my husband, um, Tony Thompson, who is um, a, a leading thinker about leadership and what it is that we need to do to create a vision that allows prosecutors to understand where it is that they're trying to go. If we imagine what a just system looks like, where is that and how can we work our way backwards to make sure that we put in place the things that will get us to that outcome? And so he talks about different forms of leadership, intersectional leadership, Leadership, making sure that you are reaching out and, and building a broad tent, not just talking with prosecutors within your office, but reaching outside and bringing in different voices. We had a chapter from Angela Jordan Davis, who is um, a, a professor at American University uh, School of Law, and she writes about what she, she has written a lot about prosecutors being the most powerful player in the criminal justice system. And she writes about what she sees uh, will be necessary to change the culture, to get us to a place where we can do progressive prosecution. Um, we have um, finally um, Kim Fox, who is uh, the first black woman, first black person who was elected DA in um, Cook County. Yes, um, Chicago, right, and, right. And Kim right. writes this powerful, powerful piece that it talks about the reaction to what she has been trying to do as she's tried to introduce racially conscious, racially alert, progressive policies, the kinds of attacks, the personal attacks, the misogynistic attacks, the racist attacks mm -hmm. that she's had to endure just to begin to make a difference there. Wow. What a collection. Just really powerful. What a collection. So we've been lucky. Uh, uh, it's fantastic, you know, I mean, and it has been so wonderful to have you here. You'll have to come back. Oh, we're, I'd love to. I'd love to. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, we're still fighting for change uh, today, as you well know, uh, as we did many years ago in our criminal justice system. But we want to have you in the leadership. We think that you and Tony are going to solve everything. Uh, we want to thank our guest, Kim Taylor Thompson, for her work. And I encourage you to get a copy of Progressive Prosecution, Race and Reform in Criminal Justice, co-edited with her husband, Anthony C. Thompson. Thanks to you for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. We'll see you the next time.